Today I want to talk to you about relationships, and I'd like to encourage you to open your Bibles to Romans 15 uh, so you can follow along. I always say open your Bibles if you would, because all I have is a bunch of pictures and a bunch of words. We really need to hear from God. So the passage to look at is Romans 15. We're going to be in a little over half a dozen verses there. As always, there is a Bible app event for this. If you have the version Bible app on your uh, uh, phone, you can load that up. And you can actually zoom in on the screen that's in front of you, and there's a QR code in the lower left-hand corner. And if you scan that, your phone should take you right to the Bible app and right to the place we are. Uh, That helps you follow along, simplifies it. If you have a paper Bible, that's just as good. So you can turn to Romans chapter 15. Um, Do you remember last week we talked about a verse in Proverbs? It was Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. And the way I remember that is because I'm familiar with something called the 1911 by a guy named Browning. Remember him? Okay. So Proverbs 1911, it is such a great verse of scripture. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm just going to, I'm going to read it to you. It says, a person's wisdom yields patience. And here's the part that, that I really love. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. And we spoke at length about that last week, how if you can let it go. Someone has done something wrong to you. If you can let it go, that is to your glory to overlook an offense. The reason I I preach that message is because I want to do this series on relationships to help you have relationships that are, that are really more meaningful to you and more, more valuable to you. And so that was the first in this sermon series. This message is the second in the sermon series, relationships, patience, grace, acceptance. You know, somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most rewarding part of living is found in relationships. I mean, we like other things like fishing and like football and like video games and like books. All those things are fun, they're great, they're enjoyable. But without relationships, life is a little bit flat. Somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most rewarding part of living is found in relationships. And somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most difficult part of living is found in relationships. We learn that fishing, it will never abandon you. Football, it will never lie. Video games, they'll never gossip about you and books will never cheat on you. But people, relationships that we cherish and desire and hunger for, the relationships tend to be fragile. They tend to be volatile. They tend to be potentially harmful. Somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most difficult part of living is found in relationships. So in these weeks ahead, I want to talk to you about relationships and what the Bible speaks about them, because I really want you to have that first word, rewarding, as what is in your mind concerning the relationships you have. And I really want to help you to to minimize that second word, difficult, when it comes to relationships. But I want to tell you this, I can't do that. I don't have the power to do that. I walked out the door this morning, I looked over my shoulder at Laurel and said, this sermon stinks. And I walked out and got in my car, but God showed up and God is the one who will help you with these things. All I have is some pictures and some words to go with them, but the spirit of God can use this in ways that will help you have strong, meaningful, vital relationships, rewarding ones. So I want to do something just because it's something I do in my heart all the time, but I want to do it with you this morning. I wanna pray that the Spirit of God would speak to us as we go through this material. And I wanna ask you if you're comfortable doing so, if you'd stand and we'll pray together, okay? So God, Eric already prayed this, that you, Holy Spirit, would be upon us this morning. I pray that you would use these lips of clay (laughs) that are on the front of my face to speak what you would have us to hear in ways that are beneficial to us. This is a desire of our heart. It's one of the reasons we came here today. Make it happen through Christ Jesus, amen. Amen, please be seated. 
So I'd like to look, if we could, into Romans chapter 15, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. We're going to go to 7, and then we're going to go to verse 13. So follow along silently, if you would, as I read. We who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And now I'll skip down to verse 13. It's a benediction, by the way, verse 13 is. The benediction is what we say at the end of a church service frequently. Benediction basically means blessing. And so here the Apostle Paul is asking a blessing on the reader, and, and I think it's tied into the idea of relationship. Look what it says in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what we want? I mean, think about it for a minute. Uh, don't you want the God of hope to fill you with joy? Yeah, I could use that. And peace, I'll take some of that too if you're dispensing it, O oh God of hope. Don't you want to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit? I think we all want that. But I think we all know that if our relationships are tense, if our relationships are marked by bitterness or anger or unforgiveness, if our relationships put the fun in dysfunctional, if our relationships are sour, it's really hard to be filled with hope. And that can block the Spirit of God giving us that kind of benediction, that kind of blessing. So what I'd like to do this morning, just from these few verses, is give you three pointers that I, I think are embedded in this text. Three pointers on having relationships that are rewarding. And the first of those pointers is this, people are in process, be patient. Be patient. I mean, the first verse speaks of that. It is on the screen. It says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings, that's patience, of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Now, naturally, you know that God is speaking here of spiritually strong people, of, of, of people who are spiritually mature. And he's contrasting how they should behave with those who are spiritually weak. And in doing that, he's telling us that not everyone grows at the same rate. Be patient. And not everyone even grows in the same area. People are in process. Be patient. It seems to me <laughs> that there are a lot of people who just don't understand this through the years. And no one ever told me this was going to happen. But people, strangers, call churches. They call my church. They call other churches and speak to the pastor. And they're contacting me about some, some member of your church. And this is how the phone call goes. Pastor, you really need to speak to that couple that attend your church. Their children are just out of control. Hmm. How about that? Pastor, there's that one young woman in your church. She wears clothing. Well, it's just not right. I think you should speak to her about modesty. This one's the best. Hey, pastor, you know that guy in your church? What's his name there? He's nothing but a gossip. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> I always reply the same way. And I picked up this reply early on in my ministry. And by the way, that doesn't happen every day, but it happens every few years that you get that kind of call. Here's how I reply. You know, as a person grows in Christ, God works in them, and gradually their perspective changes. People are in process. 
be patient. I've noticed that maturity in Christ, Christian maturity and, and Christian growth has very little to do with how long we are alive, how long we have been believers even, but it has to do with two things, how deeply we love God and how well we love others. Some are further down that highway than others. Be patient. People are in process. As we read verse 1, you probably notice that God places the burden for being patient, the responsibility for that, upon the mature, upon the stronger. We who are strong, it says in verse 1, ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And that can be hard to do. I know it can be hard to do because I've experienced it personally. I know it can be hard to do because even Jesus expressed how difficult it was to bear with the feelings, the failings of the weak. He's talking in Matthew 17, verse 17. So you're pretty far into his ministry and he's not talking to the people of Jerusalem or the people of Israel or some Gentile group. He is talking about his closest friends, talking to them. And he says this sentence, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bearing with the weak, it can be tiring. But Jesus was willing to bear with the failings of those around him. Thank God. And he instructs us to do the same. Jesus knew people are in process. Be patient. Did you notice that being patient requires sacrifice? Healthy relationships require that we deny ourselves. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. I'm letting go of pleasing myself for this moment. In the body of Christ, relationships really tend to be about sacrifice. It's learning to give. It's learning to serve. It's learning to relinquish. It's learning to let go. And it's learning to do those things because those things are the right thing to do. I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. This thing right here, it is a fault of my wife. <laughs> my wife loves to bake. And if she gets it in her head to bake something, Oh, she's looking at me like, that ain't my fault, buddy. I'm going to need to have lunch at someone else's house today. My wife loves to bake, and when she gets it in her mind to bake, she does it without hesitation. She does something else without hesitation right after that. She cleans up after baking. She clears off the counter. She cleans the mixing bowls, puts them back where they belong. She cleans all the utensils puts them where they belong. She takes that big, heavy KitchenAid mixer and she puts it down where it goes and puts the uh, beaters back in it. She wipes down the countertop. And quite honestly, I don't think she's having fun while she's doing that second part. I mean, when she's baking, I've literally seen her dancing while she's baking. Took a video of it. I'm not allowed to show it to anybody. She loves to bake. And she enjoys that. She does it. She also cleans up, and I've not seen her dancing while she does that. That's the way it is with relationships. I mean, relationships can be as sweet as a peach pie. By the way, no one ever said sweet as a pumpkin pie because those things are just wrong. <laughs> relationships can be sweet as a peach pie. You find great joy in relationships. But relationships can also be demanding and require work and require sacrifice. They, they require the sacrifice of patience, bearing with the weakness of that other person, whether it's someone you work with or someone you're behind in the checkout line or someone you're married with. They require sacrifice of patience. Relationships require repentance, seeing that you brought something into this relationship or you behaved a certain way in this relationship that simply was not pleasant or rewarding and was even unhealthy and, and saying, God, please, I don't want to do that again. 
I'm not going to do that again. Repentance. It's not pleasant, but it's part of relationships. Relationships involve saying you're sorry, requesting forgiveness. And Dr. Sovine at Tacoa Falls used to say, sometimes it's not enough to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes you have to say, will you forgive me? Requesting forgiveness for the pain you brought into the relationship. And right after that, it requires a sacrifice of granting forgiveness. When someone is genuinely repentant to say, I forgive you and no longer hold that against you. That can be hard, but that's essential if you want a rewarding relationship. And relationships require a sacrifice of moving on, letting it go. Relationships require all these things, and all of these things are acts of self-denial. You choose to do this. The weak are unable to do that. The person who says, I can't repent of that, I won't ask for forgiveness. He is not spiritually mature, he is spiritually weak. But the strong, the strong can do any of those and do them with regularity. People are in process, be patient. Let me give you a second piece of counsel from this passage. It is this, people are fragile, be gracious. I've found, though it's rare, it happens, that when someone discovers I'm a pastor, maybe I'm at a Christmas party or maybe I'm at, at a picnic or wherever I am, they find out I'm a pastor, there are certain people that avoid me. It's kind of a weird thing. I haven't even said a sentence to them. I haven't even sh shaken their hand, but they heard I'm a pastor and they go to the other side of the room or to a different picnic table that I'm sitting at. I've discussed this with other pastors. It's not unusual. Some other pastors say this. Oh, I don't worry about that. That's just the spirit of God convicting them by my presence. Goody for you, buddy. Goody for you. As I've looked into it, I've discovered that often the root of the problem is more like this. They've been around some religious folk before. Maybe they were pastors, maybe they weren't. And they found those religious folk to be ungracious, not filled with grace. And they don't want to deal with that pain again. When we are ungracious, we damage people. That might sound like a weird thing to say, but I believe it with all my heart. I think of Rodney, a guy I worked with in a brick factory. At the time, that brickyard was the most productive brickyard in the United States of America. There was one on the planet that made more bricks than us. It was in Germany. Uh, but we made bricks. All the shifts were running. All the kills were running. We were making bricks for a guy who was building a casino in Atlantic City, some Trump guy. I can't remember. All right? And so Rodney and I were there as summer employees. Um, I was studying engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He was studying for pastoral ministry. And that brickyard was bustling with workers. Many of them were clueless as to who Jesus is. And Rodney wanted to get him saved, but he was not gracious. He was accusatory. Rodney would have said, I see this as a mission field. But frankly, he saw it as a shooting gallery. <laughs> he took pot shots at everyone. He condemned them for their smoking, their drinking, their stealing things at work, their sleeping around their porn stash, their pot smoking, their music choices, anything he could find fault with, he found it to warn them they're going to hell if they don't repent. I would like to tell you as a result, the whole plant assembled together and bowed on their knees and said, oh Lord, please forgive us. But you know that wouldn't happen. That didn't happen at all. What happened is he was completely alienated, lost all his right to speak to them about anything. But even worse than that, those strong men and women, strong backs, strong arms, carrying bricks, they were fragile and he was not gracious and he damaged them. 
You may not think of lost people as fragile, but I happen to think the most broken people in the world are those who have not yet opened their heart to Christ. They're fragile. That's why verse two says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. To build them up, not to tear them down. Be gracious to people who need Christ. And doing that though, it can be serious labor. But, but Jesus in bringing about our relationship with him did all he could to build us up. I, I mean, verse three says, even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And just listen to the gracious words that follow that starting in verse four and how they speak of building us up. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice, we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How gracious God is with us. He makes it clear, people are fragile, be gracious. The third piece of counsel this passage gives is probably one of the most important in relationships. It is this, people are difficult, be accepting. People are difficult, be accepting. Have you ever noticed in any small group, <laughs> Maybe you're gonna go see a movie together, or you're gonna to go to a football game together, or you're gonna go hunting together, you're gonna to have a gaming party at home together. You get that group together, and, and there's always that one person, Steve, you know? <laughs> there's that one person, and he's kind of a problem. And I'll tell you how we handled that in high school. You know how we handled that in high school. We took him the first time, and then he was never invited again, right? That's not very gracious, is it? Uh, small group gurus who, who I've learned a ton from in small group ministry, they, they have this label, and I absolutely hate labels, but they have this label that they use for someone like that. They refer to that individual who's often a problem in a small group, a distraction. They refer to that person as an EGR. Anyone know what that means in that context? It's not exhaust gas recirculation. Uh, anybody know EGR? You're not going to believe this, but this morning I, in the early service, anyone know? Guy sitting right there said, yeah, that stands for extra grace required. Wow, he's been there, right? He, he's had that training that I had decades ago. I remember Carl George saying that. He said he was a small group guru back in the day. And he said, every group has one person that's, that requires extra grace. It's an extra grace required guy. And if you can't figure out one in your group, you're probably him. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't think that's accurate. Some time ago, I, I recognized something really important. I realized that when strong Christians, and remember, we're defining strong, mature Christians as people who love God deeply and who love others well, okay? So I realized that when strong Christians are gathered among that group and there's an EGR person there, it doesn't matter because they have the ability to just connect and allow that to happen, to happen well, because they know people are different. Be accepting. Now, I just wanna to say to you, if you're thinking, I'm a little paranoid now. I wonder if I'm the EGR in the small group I'm in. <laughs> Just check, check with me and I'll tell you. No, no. I don't believe there's an EGR in every group. And I believe that every group I'm a part of has people that manage one another well and manage the situation well. It's really a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because people who are mature in Christ know that people are difficult. And people who are mature in Christ know I need to be accepting. But let me clarify something. Accepting isn't receiving with resignation. That's just such a poorly phrased sentence, isn't it? 
Yeah, because I wrote this in the treasurer's office at Mahaffey Camp, so it's bound to be poorly phrased. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. When I say people are difficult, be accepting, that doesn't mean you go, yeah, I know they're difficult. They'll always be that way. They've always been that way. I'm just going to accept them. I'm resigned to the fact that they'll never change. That Susie, she's such a gossip, but she's been one for years. We just need to learn to live with it. That's basically, although they wouldn't say it that way, that's basically what a huge chunk of our population, our society has done. They've said, well, you know, you're not going to change that. So we're going to accept everything and everyone and every behavior and endorse them all. We're going to endorse them all. And if you can't endorse and affirm that behavior, then you're not accepting. And that is a lie, man. I hate to use this strong language, but that's a lie right from the pit of hell. You can accept someone without endorsing their behavior. Jesus did it for me. Jesus did it for you. Look at verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you to bring praise to God. How did Jesus accept you? Just as you are. In fact, there was a song that Billy Graham used. Probably millions of people heard this song and sang it. Just as I am, without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. People are difficult. Be accepting. Because Jesus accepts you not with a sigh of resignation. Oh, that person is just such a liar. But I'll just accept them and leave them that way. It'll be okay. He accepts you. (laughs) He accepts you with a sense of hope. He receives you with hope. You see, when I say people are difficult, be accepting... I am hoping that you will accept them not on the basis of how they are, but on the basis of, basis of what they might become. You, you know, you're, you're kind of like the guy that buys the old 72 Olds Cutlass. Not because of what it is, but because of what it will become. That's what Jesus does with me. That's what he does with you. He purchased us with his blood because he knew what we could become. He paid for our redemption for our transformation. He paid for all of that. He accepted us, broken as we were, because of the hope of what we could be. Hope of redemption. Hope of transformation. Hmm. People are difficult. Be accepting. Somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most rewarding part of living is found in relationships. That without relationships, life is a little bit flat. And somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most difficult part of living is found in relationships. I want to pray that you and I, that we would, let me go back to that. I want to pray that you and I, that we would find... (laughs) more of the former reward and less of the latter difficulty. And that we would find that because we are choosing to accept that people are in process. We must be patient. And we are choosing to live with the knowledge that people are fragile. We will be gracious. And that we are sold on understanding that people are difficult. We will be accepting. I want to pray that you and I would do that. So if you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together and we will pray to that end. I just want you to think back over this for a moment. People are in process, be patient. Is there someone whom you have crowded with your demands of uh, change needed in their behavior? And failed to be patient. And, and that's a hard thing to know, right? But just talk to the Spirit of God about it and say, show me, God, have I not been patient with someone who is in process? And then second, I want you to ask yourself, have I failed to be gracious with someone and, and in their fragility, have I damaged them along the way? 
Ask yourself that question. Ask the Spirit of God that question because you can beat yourself up if you're not careful. So ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand that. And, and third, is there, is there someone who, who I just haven't accepted <laughs> because I haven't had the hope of redemption and transformation that God, God offers them? Have, have I failed to accept them along the way? Just think that over and ask the Spirit of God about that. And if, if you see that, then ask the Spirit of God, how can I... How can I how can I redeem that? How can I correct that? How can I fix that? And, and he'll show you that. In the meantime, I wanna pray that we don't let that happen as frequently as we might have prior to this. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your patience with us. How long will I put up with this wicked and perverse generation, how long do I have to be with you? Jesus, I think you saying that to the disciples, I can't imagine the expression on their face, but I know you probably have said it about me or to me many times. You said it to all of us. Because it's hard to be patient with people that are in process and yet you always were. Make us the same. Help us to be patient with people in process. And help us, God, to be gracious with people because they are fragile. They are, it's so easy to alienate people from you. God, forgive us when we do that. May we be men and women who live by grace, walk by grace. Help grace to flow from our from our person, like living water. Like you say, Jesus, if anyone believes in me, living water will flow from his belly. <laughs> may that flow from us and may it be a gracious, refreshing stream. And I pray too that we would be accepting of difficult people, people who don't think like us or act the way we know they should or think they should. Help us do that so we don't close doors Help us do that so that they have a chance to hear you and experience the transformation that you offer. I pray this because we so love you, Jesus. We so want to be like you. We ask you to make us so, for Christ's sake, amen.